with the first talk here. So I'm going to talk about patella instability and uh, just kind of bring this full circle in terms of how I approach a patient and what I think of in terms of what truly matters. Um, disclosures, none really apply to what I'm going to talk about. So firstly, you got to understand what you're dealing with and make the diagnosis accurately. Um, does that work? No, okay. But uh, got it. Every time a patella dislocates, the MPFL has to be torn, 100%. You don't need an MRI to tell you that. In fact, if it's a chronic case, the MRI may confuse things because it'll be read as intact because it heals and that layer is intact, but it's torn 100%, it's incompetent, don't even need to look at the MRI for that. And about half of these patients will dislocate again. Not everybody, but if you've had a second dislocation, the writing's on the wall, they're gonna keep having instability. What's the consequence of recurrent instability? Cartilage damage. Cartilage damage we all know is permanent. We know none of that heals, so we wanna prevent that. These are typically adolescents, and they're, so their knee's at risk. And, and to, sometimes it can be hard to make this diagnosis, especially in bigger patients, um, and one thing, that, a test that's very useful is a moving apprehension test. Quad completely relaxed, try to slide the patella over as you flex the knee. Where does it lock in the groove? Where can you not move it at all? And you compare this side to side. I found this extremely helpful sometimes. Is this pain related buckling or is this true instability? With a leg extended, you're, people sometimes you can slide the patella all over the place. It's hard to know. But comparing side to side, you can really tell, well, this one locks in at 30 degrees. I can't move it at all. The other side, I can go up to 80 degrees. The further you can flex the knee and slide that patella with the quad relaxed, the more is going on. In general, the more you have to do. So a very useful test um, that I, I would share with you guys. And first and most important, reconstruct the anatomy. Okay? Maybe some of you guys, I hope you're not, but maybe still would do an imbrication or advancements. Doesn't work. Clearly doesn't work. Here's a couple of very good studies. Randomized, non-op or repair, equal redislocation rates. In another study, 45% redislocation rate after MPFL repair or advancement. Doesn't work, doesn't reconstruct the anatomy, do not do an MPFL repair or advancement. Instead, reconstruct the MPFL with a graft. It's gonna be strong. Any of the hamstring grafts are more strong than the native MPFL. It's reliable. My go-to is a gracilis. Semi-T works fine. Allograft, autograft, doesn't matter. But you got to put it in the right spot. These bottom three pictures, the pin doesn't move, just the rotation of the knee. And look at how subtle the difference is in rotation on the posterior condyles. The pin looks all over the place. You got to get a perfect lateral, find Schottel's point. That's a reference. Put your pin in, wrap the graft around it, range the knee, look at the behavior, and then understand, is that in the right spot or not? You put it in the wrong spot, it's gonna be shorter here, longer down here in flexion, something's gotta give. That graft's gonna rupture or they're not gonna be able to bend their knee. So you gotta put it in the right spot, that's everything. This is a study we did, and from it we coined the phrase high and tight. Graft behavior based on where you put it on the femur, that green line is the proximal, too high. And that is where we got the expression high and tight. And, if, and uh, as you flex the knee, the graft gets tighter. If you see that, you've gotta change it in the OR or you're gonna have a problem later. Uh, if it gets looser, she flex too loose, that's, that's low and loose. It's hard to do because you get too distal, you get into, into the notch. But uh, too proximal or too anterior also is, is the worst mistake you can make. And you gotta recognize that. So how do you fix it? Um, you can fix it to the patella a variety of ways. It probably doesn't matter as much as long as it's secure. So probably most people in the country use suture anchors. Recognize that no suture anchor is designed for the patella. They're all designed for other bones. And if you guys put in suture anchors and you test them, you probably all had the experience where you pop one out. Okay, then what? Then you size up and you're like, I, mean, I don't wanna pull that one as hard this time. So that's not a really settling feeling in the OR. I've gone now to the oldest anchors out there, these metal pronged anchors, uh, cheapest ones available because they hold better in that, that patella bone. Uh, the other thing I do quite often, most often, are drill holes in the patella. Now, drill holes all the way across the patella got a bad rap for fracture risk. That was with 4.5 millimeter tunnels that went fully, fully across. I use a 3.2 millimeter drill bit, and through that I can get a gracilis or trim it down to fit, and as obliquely as I can, and it typically will get this kind of an x-ray, so it's going about a third to 40% of the way across, one fracture in 343 knees. Okay, so fracture risk is not the problem with this approach, 3.2 millimeter drill bit and a, and a double loop graph with a gracilis. 
works very well, saves the cost of two anchors. Those of you who have surgery centers you're affiliated with, works quite well. So ne the next question is beyond reconstructing the MPFL, what else do I have to do and do I have to do something? This, this is, I think, where there's a bit of uh, controversy and art involved, uh, but here's, a, I think, a useful study. So this is a systematic review of 17 studies, and it was looking at the risk factors for the uh, associated with recurrent instability, and you can see the dysplasia, open physis, malalignment, and patella alta, and each of them are associated with uh, increased risk of, of recurrence, but most importantly is this. When you start combining risk factors, it goes way up. If you've got three anatomic risk factors, one of which is open physis, it's 75% risk of instability, recurrent instability. So in my mind, that really prompts me to change anatomy. And a lot of these patients have multiple things going on. Here's another study that looks at people who had surgery and failed. And you can see if you have two or more risk factors, how much the risk goes up. So if you got two or certainly three anatomic risk factors, that's when I really think about changing the anatomy. So every patient, I'm going to measure this, quantify it, understand it. What's the dominant factor at play? Because typically you're dealing with a vector that's pulling the patella sideways. And I really think of this in terms of vectors. So I assess this in each of these patients, which is most dominant. Now, we're probably all familiar with the TTTG. Uh, this measures in the coronal plane malalignment. It's not a number to be taken in absolute. And of all the risk factors, this one alone is probably least important as a, as a single risk factor. However, it's probably the easiest to change and can help improve your vector. So, but at a, as a standalone, it's not as important. More than 20 is abnormal. More than 16 is probably a factor. And our goal to correct it is to, is to 10 or less. I think even more helpful to me is this, this new measure came out in 2018, this reference, patella tendon lateral trochlear ridge. So the first cut that's all tendon just below the patella and you measure in the plane of the tendon relative to the apex of the lateral femoral condyle, how much tendon is draped over the edge. This just makes common sense. You just look at that and you realize the vector is going to pull it sideways. If I just put an MPFL in there and try to pull it over, I'm still fighting that vector. You, you'll often see irritated tissue and edema from it tracking that way. Very useful. This in this study was more predictive than a, than a TTTG number that was too high. So I, I increasingly rely on this greater than five and a half millimeters. Look at the, the numbers here. Very, very useful uh, uh, prognosticator for recurrent instability in the coronal plane as a, as a risk factor. And then we can, can do a tubercle osteotomy. We can move it over. You can also move it down if you have patella alta and fix it with screws and very, very effective way to change that risk factor. The other thing I, I measure on every patient is a degree of valgus. I used to think I could eyeball a patient and say, that one's got valgus, ought to go send it for longstanding films. I cannot. I mean, as many patients as I see, I, I realize I cannot eyeball this. So now across the board, I get longstanding films on everybody. And I'm sometimes surprised, especially depending on, on, on you know, height, weight, size, morph, et cetera. And so more than six, so basically seven or greater is significant as an anatomic risk factor. And, I'm, and you may need to think about changing uh, valgus with a distal femoral osteotomy, opening wedge. These are typically the, the deformities in the femur. You can confirm that. Um, almost always it's in the femur. And you can, you can do an opening wedge osteotomy, uh, placing, using a femoral head allograft, cutting a wedge to your desired degree of opening and putting it in that defect holds it in place and really helps the security of your reconstruction. This will improve your uh, TTTG by seven to 10 millimeters just in terms of, do, of doing the math. Very, very effective. If you miss this, it can really be a problem in terms of, of the vector, especially if you ever see as a really unusual problem, but flexion instability, whereas people bend, they then dislocate. It's almost always valgus and or antiversion, which is a bit more complicated. If they're still growing, I'll lean on my pediatric colleagues to do guided growth in a physial tether. Very, very effective. Kind of low-hanging fruit, tiny incision, um, easy to recover, correct a lot of things for the future, reduce the risk of ACL tear, future arthritis, et cetera. I think uh, Keith and I have talked quite a bit. We probably ought to be more aggressive with this because it helps so much for these kids if they have patella instability and recognize some valgus while they're growing. And most of them are still growing. So patella alta, we're also appreciating, uh, is probably the most important single risk factor because it magnifies the effect of everything else. The higher the patella starts, you have to flex much more deeply till it engages in the groove. So anything else that's off 
is going to be magnified by patella alta. And um, two ways to measure it. We've really abandoned the insol body ratio and gone to the CD ratio because the patella nose has no effect on congruity and containment for that patella. So you look at the length of the articular cartilage relative to the top of the, of the uh, plateau and H divided by P is your CD ratio greater than 1.2 is abnormal. Um, most surgeons correct it if it's greater than 1.4. Um, there's a new paper I just reviewed that's gonna come out in, in uh, AJSM that's showing 1.3 is, is, is really, really important. So uh, patella alta is very important. You can also look at overlap. Sometimes you can have a short trochlea, which manifests the same way. And in terms of the cartilage percentage overlap, less than 25% is important. So some of these people have a J sign. This is a jumping J sign. Every time this person bends their knee, it jumps over like that. So what's going on? So that's a patella that, that completely leaves bony restraint and full extension, plus as an abnormal vector pulling it sideways. This is typically patella alta with trochlear dysplasia. So it's got a convex shape up in the top of the trochlea. And so every time you go into extension, it hits that convexity and jumps sideways. And they have an abnormal vector, which probably played a role in developing the trochlear dysplasia. So just to show you the importance of the vector, this patient who has that combination, watch what happens when I change the vector by rotating the foot. So I've externally rotated the foot, the tubercle goes externally too, right? Effectively increasing the TTDG, you saw that jump. And now we're gonna internally rotate. You see the dramatic difference. So that's kind of understanding how vectors are still playing a role despite dysplasia, alt, all those things. You still got to think as a vector. And so by moving the tubercle, I'll effectively do it by rotating the foot there. You can also do that with a wake patient and an awake patient in the office, especially if you're sitting with their legs over the table. So I'm correcting the patella alta if it's a more than 1.4. Um, and if I'm doing a tubercle osteotomy anyway, if it's anything above 1.2, I'm going to bring it down with a goal of getting a 1.1. OK, and uh, also if they have a JSON on the exam and the combination of dysplasia and alta. So I've done a lot of work with, with trochlear dysplasia. Quite often, if you have patella alta, you can bring the patella distally and get past the area that's dysplastic and not have to worry about the dysplasia. If you start high enough, you have an opportunity to move it down and the and dysplasia may matter less. OK, what's different with this patient? So you can't do that on everybody. So here's a patient who failed very well done surgery, tubercle, NPFL. They had a little bit of valgus, but their numbers then are great. I mean, those numbers are terrific, except for mild valgus. They still had a jump in JSON and couldn't actively extend their knee fully. It would absolutely get stuck. Had been moved way over, way down. But the difference is they had a convex trochlea in the area where the patella still needed to engage. So, Trochlear dysplasia is really about whether it's convex where the patella has to articulate with it. It's not about flatness. Flatness is no problem. You can, you can balance flatness, but when it's convex, that small subgroup of patients has trouble and you can see how unusual the anatomy is. The base of the trochlear groove should be flush with the anterior femoral cortex. They have a huge, it's over 10 millimeters sitting up in front and it's convex at the top. And those are the ones that need a deepening trochleoplasty where we drop it down to where it's flush with the anterior femoral cortex. So I really think about it in those terms, in terms of convexity where it articulates. And then you have these kind of bizarre, that's a CT arthrogram. You can see where that's, you know, which way is that going to go? You see the chondrosis, you're getting the egg on the table concept. So this, you can, don't worry about this so much, the, the du jour classification. It's B's and D's, but it's really do I have this convex shape up there that's articulating with the patella? That's going to guide you for those that small subset that needs treatment. So again, flat on flat, that you can balance. That isn't the problem. Um, and these are the patients you see when they're asleep. They still have this pronounced jumping J sign. This is a view from the top looking down at a J sign. And this 19-year-old, you can see the, the, the chondral damage that you're getting in these patients. So here's the take-home message. Three or more anatomic risk factors, correct the vector. You're not going to solve that problem with an isolated MPFL. Patella alta is a key one to correct. Patella alta and dysplasia, that combination is a bad player. You got to do something more than MPFL. Jumping J sign definitely needs something more than MPFL. And it's a small subset with that convex shape and it's prominent that needs a trochleoplasty. I didn't mention lateral lengthening the whole talk. It's the last thing I do. That's not going to solve your instability. That's to balance it at the end. 
So that's not, that's really just to kind of balance everything that you've done up to that point, correcting the vector, not to fix your instability. So I'm very happy to introduce two of uh, my other partners, Chuck Sue and Winston Guafmi are gonna talk about HIP. We're fortunate now to have two folks here, two high level folks doing HIP. Uh, so we're very unique and, and thankful for that. So thank you, you guys. Quick comment, uh, Dr. Dita, you know, I've been listening to this Berkeley platform talk and I've watched him do a few cases and <laughs> I don't know why anyone would want to do these cases, but uh, he's become an international expert for this problem and he's involved at the international level. It's amazing how many people come around to have him treat them for this issue. That is, again, what my goal is and hope is for this facility is we become has definitely started us in that direction with this topic. But Winston, who's the first, yeah, first case? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, David. So two things before I start. One is if anyone in training or even in practice, if you find yourself a sports doctor and you have a patellofemoral guy in your practice, that's good news. I've got David Dedek in my practice. Having a patella whisper is incredible to have in your practice. And not just like the operative stuff, the non-op stuff, and just understanding it, he can look at an MRI of a patella and like tell what, like tell like what like astrological sign that person has. It's incredible what he can derive just from looking at an MRI of a. a what's that? Yeah, exactly. The second thing I'll say is that I always wanted to come back to UVA to be on faculty. Like I was really excited. I was a resident here. I was like, I want to be a sports guy. I want to be Dr. David Deed. I want to be Dr. Mark Miller. And I remember sitting down with the chair at the time, Mark Abel and Mark Miller, and they, you can certainly come back here to be faculty all i gotta do is be a hip arthroscopist i'm like what the hell is hip arthroscopy um i had never seen it before i uh, as i didn't even know it was a, a thing so back in 2012 i had to kind of change my entire tune and see all the trainings in the room make sure you understand kind of what you're getting yourself into because here i am now 10 years in and I, all i do is hip arthroscopy which i honestly love i'm also the program director for this and i understand the group here is not a bunch of hip arthroscopists and so what i wanted to try to do with this talk is just basically make it as general as possible and try to tell the people in the room how i looked at the x-ray and then dr susan McConnell and talk about some stuff too so back when i was a resident the algorithm and for a lot of people in this room for hip pathology is if it looks like this do this and that was it i mean it was a equals b and that's how it went and so what i'm going to try and teach you is that Till hip arthroplasty might not be for everybody. So it's important to try to understand that this 25-year-old dancer with hip dysplasia, maybe not a good arthroplasty candidate, but in fact, she's got a big problem. Or this person, lacrosse player with a big cam deformity, maybe a till hip arthroplasty, he might not be the answer for them. So I think it's important to understand that, at least in my practice, you only have two ends of the spectrum. You've got an unstable hip or if it's too tight and trying to tease out the differences, the nuances that really to me, I think the reason why I want to do this talk is to talk really about the imaging. So to me, if I only had one thing to look at, an AP x-ray would be the best thing I could possibly have. And so um, I don't know if anybody, I showed this, this picture to the residents in the room. They had no idea what this, this magic eye is. I think some of the older people in the room know what this is, where you have, to, you have to kind of squint and you can kind of see the things like a schooner. There's a really famous scene in Mall Rats where the guy sits there and stares at it for a while before he can finally see the schooner. So eventually what my clinic sometimes looks like is me trying to see things out of these plain x-rays that other people don't see, right? So I'm going to try and just go through it in detail how I do it, okay? The first thing on the AP x-ray you have to do is try to envision how the cup is positioned inside the patient, okay? You're looking for three main things, the anterior rim, the posterior rim, and the source seal. The relationship between those three lines can really give you the entire answer for how that entire acetabulum is oriented and how deep it is, okay? So once you get those three lines, you can kind of create a cup in your mind and how that cup is oriented, how deep it is, is really important for how that patient's gonna do. So here's your two different, like just a spectrum of acetabular orientation and volume. You see on the left, you've got this upsloping source seal, this, this uncovered anterior rim, uncovered posterior rim. So what you have here is you have a low volume socket Upsloping sore seal, undercovered, that's an unstable hip right there, okay? It acts very different from the one here on the right, where you have this base of the sore seal that wraps all the way around the lateral head. You've got this anterior wall that hangs halfway down the head, and this posterior wall that hangs like three-quarters way down the head. That's a very deep socket. That's over coverage. These two hips might present to your clinic with a labral tear with hip pain. They might be a 30-year-old runner, but these are two very different entities, Okay. Um, so if you want to talk about the, the spectrum of version, you really have a spectrum that goes from anaversion 
to retroversion and trying to pick out the walls is really important, at least for me to try to understand how to treat those patients. And if you start looking at your arthroplasty cases, you'll start seeing these nuances on your arthroplasty patients because people with excessive anniversion or retroversion are going to be at higher risk for arthritis. So that's the that's the S tabular side. The femoral side is just basically the ball that fits into the socket. So Dr. Tom Brown told me in a perfect scenario to her hip arthroplasty, you basically got a you got a, a, a round ball on a stick that's going to have the least possible impingement you could possibly have. So if you have a round femoral head that fits into the socket, it can roll around no problem. It's like a joystick, okay? The problem is some people aren't perfectly round. This is a femoral head shape more like an egg. Again, I'm trying to really dumb this down uh, as best I can. There's a lot more nuance to this. When you have an egg-shaped femoral head in the acetabulum, as you can see, as it tries to roll around in there, it can't do what it needs to do. So that's important to look for on the lateral x-ray, okay? So I'll get this 45-degree done lateral, show you the nice, the nice look of the neck. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at that neck and try to understand how that's fitting inside the socket. And so you can start looking for things in that femoral neck. You can look for a loss of offset, meaning the ball no longer is concave, it becomes convex. You look for a bony remodeling. I'm like Dr. Dita looking at a trochlea here, trying to figure out where is this clotting inside the joint. So alpha angle is kind of the big thing we use. You're trying to figure out how round it is. And this is basically the gauge we use to see how round it is. You're trying to see where that femoral head falls out of sphericity. So you have to realize that cam deformities come in many shapes, okay? They can look very, very different. You can have... Some cams that really just don't have enough offset, like this one, where basically the ball never rounds itself out, or some that look like this, where you have a giant bump. And you can imagine what it's going to do inside the hip. So what I would tell you is you have, let, let the x-ray tell the story. I have no idea what this story is, but let the x-ray tell you the story, okay? So this is a picture of a femoral, of, of a, a patient that came to my clinic. And if you look really, really closely, you can imagine this person that's there during activities. You see this dent in the femoral head. You see this blunting in the sore seal. You can see how... If you take this hip and you take it in a little bit more flexion, you can almost imagine how it might collide inside the joint, how the labrum, the soft tissue ring that's got all the innervation can get crushed inside there and how this could be a problem. Same on this one. You see the shallow hip. You have basically an upsloping sore seal. Make it into a ball and a line. It's really basic. Watch what happens when you put that person into motion. They're going to want to escape the joint. That labrum is going to be holding on for dear life. It's going to split right at the interface between the bone and the soft tissue, and it's going to tear. This is dysplasia, okay? So, again, here's another picture of a big cam deformity. And you can imagine this person's in their 20s right now, okay? And you take them, you take them to arthroscopy, and you, you start moving their hip around, look what happens. So what happens is the femoral head will collide against the socket. The entire medial clear space opens up, and it just absolutely shreds that person's labrum. And so we're trying to start to identify these earlier. We're trying to address this. And if I'm successful in my practice, like Dr. Tom Brown, James Brown, Quaid, you guys aren't practicing more because I'm going to basically vaccinate all the young people against hip arthritis. And so used to be doing total knees. So... Um, Back to the hip clinic, I don't know if anybody ever watched Harry Potter, but you have these like jelly beans. And if you look at the jelly beans, they all look pretty good. The problem with hip clinic is if you look closely, you might have a booger, dirt, earthworm, earwax, rotten egg, vomit. These are the jelly beans we have in our clinic all the time. And so what I'm going to tell you is that Dr. Chuck Sue, my partner, is going to tell you how to pick the right jelly bean. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so for those of you who uh, haven't met um, Chuck Su, one of the new faculty in uh, sports here, uh, the honor of uh, presenting on uh, treatment and patient selection in hip arthroscopy and uh, hopefully uh, have you guys not picking booger flavored uh, jelly beans. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, so not infrequently, we'll have uh, patients present to a clinic um, being referred, saying that someone referred them because they, quote, have a labral tear and are here because they need surgery. Uh, and so just like Dr. Didak and Dr. Guathmi uh, were saying, the first uh, step of postoperative success is to get the diagnosis right. And so just like identifying the real Spider-Man, um, you know, it's critical to be able to di differentiate from acetabular impingement from uh, a variety of other pathologies in and around the hip. Um, and for me, uh, a big part of this is making sure their history, physical exam and imaging are consistent. And often this requires kind of serial visits uh, and exams to confirm the diagnosis as well as kind of establish patient rapport. Um, and rarely are you ever, uh, at least in my clinic, uh, signing up patients for surgery on their first visit. Uh, in addition, many injuries around the hip improve with uh, rest, activity modification, uh, anti-inflammatories, and physical therapy. Uh, Treatment-wise, uh, we typically always begin with non-operative treatment uh, with physical therapy uh, being an important first-line modality. 
Uh, there have been quite a few studies now comparing physical therapy and surgery for femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, and while most have demonstrated superior short-term short -term outcomes for uh, surgery versus uh, physical therapy, uh, PT does result in improved uh, patient-reported outcomes uh, and does not appear to compromise uh, surgical outcomes uh, and really has uh, minimal downside. In addition, ultrasound-guided hip injections can be a really uh, powerful tool uh, in the uh, workup of potential hip arthroscopy patients. Uh, these can be both diagnostic as well as therapeutic uh, and can be really useful, especially in the workup of patients who may have a more kind of borderline exam or patients who uh, may have numerous kind of simultaneous pathologies uh, at work. Uh, the response uh, following intraarticular hip injection can be also a very important prognosticator. Uh, and studies have shown that a negative response to injection is a strong predictor for poor surgical outcomes. Um, and so in clinic, I'll typically uh, examine the patient five or 10 minutes after an injection and document their response to their injection within my note. Uh, and for those who are uh, interested in adding this to your clinical practice, uh, this uh, technique uh, paper and video by Dr. Bird is, is quite useful. So when is arthroscopic hip surgery indicated? Um, so just like shooting an arrow through multiple uh, arrowheads, there are several criteria that sh should be met, at least in my hands. Um, they, should be, uh, they should have pain that is localizable to the hip joint, uh, and this should be consistent across their history of physical exam as well as their imaging. Uh, they should have persistent symptoms that are refractory to conservative treatment of, of at least six to eight weeks. Uh, and to me, this demonstrates some patient buy-in and willingness to participate in some of these conservative measures. Um, they should have uh, evidence of significant damage within the joint, uh, as well as uh, some impingement morphology, just like um, uh, Dr. Guathmi was uh, discussing. And so part of uh, selecting winners in hip arthroscopy is to avoid those kind of booger-flavored uh, jelly beans, right? And so these are patients that you may potentially want to avoid in hip arthroscopy, um, or you're going to have a bad time. Um, and so this is kind of a list of factors that have been shown in the literature to be correlated with poor outcomes uh, following hip arthroscopy. Uh, probably the most important one is hip arthritis. So uh, patients with less than two millimeters of joint space, uh, those with bipolar chondral loss and uh, subchondral cysts, uh, patients who um, uh, have not undergone adequate uh, rehab or conservative management. Um, as Winston was saying, the uh, patients with dysplasia and shallow hips are also uh, likely to have poor outcomes uh, after hip arthroscopy as they likely need some sort of bony procedure. Um, and pain coming from uh, elsewhere, myofascial pain syndromes, unrealistic expectations, as well as patients with uh, morbid obesity, uh, where you can see this kind of large panis, oh, sorry, uh, even on their x-rays, uh, have been shown to have poor outcomes, as well as making the uh, arthroscopic surgery um, uh, much more technically uh, challenging. So we don't have um, uh, time to go into all the nuances of kind of modern uh, hip arthroscopy. Uh, but it's currently done on some sort of traction bed, um, and it is currently uh, rapidly evolving over the last several decades. Uh, probably one of the uh, biggest changes over the last five years or so is the move away from kind of posted traction, which was kind of the gold standard before, um, to most people using some sort of uh, postless uh, friction kind of foam padding. Uh, and this has really helped to minimize a lot of the perineal complications that were um, associated with prolonged traction time using a post. And so the goals of hip arthroscopy are to identify uh, patterns of damage and address chondral and uh, labral damage. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, performing a labral repair and kind of stabilizing some of that cartilage injury, uh, treating mechanical causes of hip pain and dysfunction uh, to hopefully improve the biomechanics of the hip joint by making the ball and socket uh, uh, more congruent and to hopefully slow the degenerative process. And so in terms of outcomes, uh, we're now starting to see publications um, on 10 plus year outcomes uh, uh, following hip arthroscopy, um, overall showing uh, good outcomes, uh, although it's, there is significant variability, particularly with regards to 10 year survival rates. And if you look at kind of single institution studies, um, most of these have reported kind of uh, 10 year survival rates of over 90 percent. Um, however, a larger kind of systematic reviews of um, uh, this most, most recent one of over uh, 1,500 patients uh, painted a more humbling view of between 67.5 and 90, uh, kind of 98% uh, survival. And so why is this very large discrepancy um, present? And I think part of this is that um, hip arthroscopy is a very uh, 
technically challenging procedure with a steep and long learning curve. Um, and so this was a uh, study published in uh, 2018 in AGSM uh, demonstrating that uh, surgeons with uh, career uh, hips arthroscopy volumes over 519, uh, 519 was kind of the, the cutoff number for um, having uh, reoperation rates and complications that dropped into kind of the lowest um, strata. And so I kind of keep this in the back of my mind as I'm kind of early in practice to um, just kind of try to continue to learn from um, every single case that I, that I do. Um, with that, thank you for your attention. You do not want me talking about scoliosis. You can try. I would be very good at. And um, I'm the Werner slides, if you remember. Perfect. Um, so while he's getting those up, I just wanted to build on what Winston said a little bit. So I am an alumnus. I finished residency here in 2015. And I remember when I was fake interviewing for the job here, Winston said, you know what, you're getting the job that I wanted. So I was being hired to be a multiple ligament and complex knee surgeon um, because Miller was going to retire um, and he's, he's still here. Um, but so Winston kept saying over and over again, you're getting the job I wanted. And so fast forward seven years and about 80% of my practice is not what I was hired to do. So um, I'm now probably 70, 80% degenerative shoulder and I love it and it, it's great. Um, hopefully at some point I'll get a little more sports stuff in my practice. So it, it's funny just how practices change over time. Winston stuck with the hip stuff. I haven't really stuck with the knee stuff too much, but hopefully some opportunity coming up in the near future to get more knee. Um, so I was challenged to talk about complicated cuff. Um, hard to talk about in, in 10 minutes or so, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, and so one of the other things that I did when I first started in practice is um, I recognized that in order to get busy with all of these great orthopedic surgeons is I just had to be willing to do anything other than hip, other than elbow. Um, and so I wasn't willing to do hip, but anything else is that if it's a hard surgery, I'm happy to do it. And so in addition to saying, gosh, you know, I'll take all the multiple ligament knees, um, I'll take all the complex knee. I said, any challenging shoulder, I know we have Steve Brockwire, but he has to be getting tired of it at this point in time. Um, I'll take any challenging, any challenging shoulder, bring it to me. And so any complex instability patient, any kind of large rotator cuff tear where the access staff, the other surgeon wasn't sure about, I said, send it to me. Um, that can be a little bit challenging when you first start in practice. Um, and so this was kind of the maze that I was thinking about when I'd see these patients, because the algorithm changed from when I was a resident to when I was a fellow. Um, and then already in seven years of practice, it's changed a lot. Um, and so kind of what makes a cuff complicated, it's not just necessarily the tear itself. And so there's a lot of factors that we're trying to think about when we go in the room. Um, that can be patient factors, so age and sex, their comorbidities and smoking. Then a lot of things about the tear itself too. And so tear size, tear retraction, tissue quality, whether they have arthritis or not, how much they're superiorly migrated on an X-ray or an MRI, how much atrophy there is. And so it's often very difficult to go in a room where you have about five minutes. I tend to preview a little bit and try to look at the images before I go in the room. Um, but even still, you have all these different things you're thinking about when you go in the room. It can be pretty challenging just to kind of put patients into buckets and figure out, you know, what is the right treatment for this patient. It's also challenging because there's a lot of treatments. And I don't know if it's the number of treatments that make it complicated or if it's the fact that it's complicated, that's why we have so many treatment options for it. Um, but in addition to having all these different challenging diagnoses and, and factors to put them into a bucket, then figuring out what to do when you have all these treatment al uh, kind of algorithms can be very challenging. Uh, and so it can be a little bit of a whirlwind, particularly early in practice, but I found the further I've gone in practice, the more challenging it is because I find more tools that I become good at. And so it makes it very difficult to figure out what the right thing is. And so I don't know how many of you are at AOSSM, but JT Tokish gave a very good talk. I go to lots of meetings every year, and I tend to not pay attention to a lot of what's talked about. But JT Tokish gave a little bit of a discussion about a, an algorithm for the complex irreparable cuff. Um, and so I've adapted that a little bit into my talk just because it really stuck home. And I found myself taking a photograph of it. And so he knows I'm putting a little bit of this in here. Um, but what he basically talked about was four main questions to think about when you're seeing a complex or irreparable rotator cuff. Um, the first is, do they have arthritis? The second is age and activity, and those go together a little bit. And so older age doesn't necessarily mean low activity. High activity doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be younger or older. And so thinking about those kind of in a continuum, and that's a little bit where the art of medicine gets in. And then what kind of function does the patient have? And then finally, what's the status of their cuff muscles at alive or dead? And he proposed a really nice algorithm based on those four questions and kind of using that to simplify it a little bit. And so the first question was, do they have significant degenerative joint disease or not? 
If they do, it's easy. They get a reverse shoulder replacement. The hard thing is a lot of patients will fall in between. And so there's a massive gray area in between the two of these. Um, and so you, you, it's a little bit of a decision you have to make in the room, but it's a pretty simple decision. If they have arthritis, they're going to get a reverse shoulder replacement. The next, and I think this is the most challenging thing, is age and activity level. It's a little bit of a continuum. Um, but if it's an older patient, when if it's a patient or if it's a patient who's inactive, or they fall somewhere in that category. Um, for a massive cup tear, they're going to get a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. It has great outcomes. The more challenging patients are going to be the younger or the more active patients. That needs to be a truly active patient, not someone who says they're active, because almost everyone who comes to my clinic claims they have some level of activity. And so for the patients who are younger or who are more active, then you need to see whether they have good function or they don't have good function. If they have good function, we have a lot of options. It'd be challenging to decide between those. You have dermal allograft. I've seen a lot of uh, lectures now about using biceps autograft as an augment. Um, you have balloon spacers, and then you have the opportunity to build muscle for them. Non-functional patients, then it's whether their cuff muscle is alive or dead. And so if they're very atrophied and their cuff muscle is dead, pretty easy. Most of the time, they're going to get a reverse shoulder placement for me. If they're a very young patient, I um, could consider a tendon transfer. If their cuff, cuff muscle is alive, I still consider them for superior capsule reconstruction. Talk a little bit more about that um, when I get into superior capsule reconstruction. This is my clinic, and I think our residents or fellows might find this a little bit hilarious. See, they're laughing. Got it. Perfect. Um, so when they show up into my clinic, pretty much everyone gets a reverse shoulder replacement. Um, and so I don't know if that's because I only see patients who fall into the categories, but it seems like everything leads to reverse. And for the most part, they do pretty good. Um, but I still like to do the other operations also. Um, please don't take a picture of that slide. I just thought it would be... <laughs> That'd be a little bit funny. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of them just a little bit, kind of just the highlights from each of them. So dermal allograft augmentation, I did exactly zero of these in fellowship, um, and I still do a, a fair number of them now. I really enjoy the operation. So these need to be your younger patients, your patients without arthritis who still have good function. And so there's a couple of advantages to it that I found in the literature and that I've seen in my own practice, and I'm sure Steve can, can back me up on it also. Uh, number one, it makes the repair stronger. And so if you have a piece of relatively thick tissue, um, that's going to improve the pull-out strength of the tensile load of the repair. Um, I always thought personally, and I think Steve feels the same way, that it decreases adhesion somewhat in the subacromial space. And so notice a lot that these dermal allografts come back to clinic in a week or two and they don't have pain. And oftentimes they're a painful patient. And so there's at least one paper recently in animal study that showed decreased subacromial adhesions. I think that's a very powerful advantage of using a dermal allograft and leads me to want to do more. Um, and then a recent paper from Pat Denard showed improved healing rates, better range of motion, higher patient reported outcomes. So it's something that I probably actually increased in practice. I've found a really good outcomes from it. Certainly I've had some who failed it. It's a challenging population, but definitely still a good tool to have in the tool bag for the right patient. Um, here's one case of that is a 56 year old right hand dominant. This is typically what I see in practice. So he's employed, but it's workers comp and he hasn't worked for a year. He's had two prior rotator cuff repairs in an outside hospital. Good passive motion, pretty weak, and his active function is, is not great. No arthritis on his x-rays, but if you look at his MRI after two rotator cuff repairs, pretty thin looking tendon, reasonable amount of retraction. However, um, only mild atrophy. So I thought this would be a pretty reasonable patient for a, a dermal allograft. Get in there, you got your prior stitches. Once you've debrided out the bad tissue, not the most mobile tear of all time, um, but still a good candidate, I think, for a, a repair with an augment. So you're able to get the repair. The nice thing about the augment is the augment hides your repair. So you get a great photograph afterwards and it looks fantastic. Um, and so that's what it looks like when it's done. And then, of course, I'm only going to show you a page, that case where the patient does well. So he's two and a half years post-op now. He actually returned to work full duty. So he falls outside that group of people who usually when they reach a, a year of not working for workers, they don't do well. He's able to get back to things that he does, and, and he's a mover. And so you have to use them. And so you can certainly get good outcomes with it. But you really have to pick the right patients because a lot of them at reverse arthroplasty may be better. So move on next to biceps autograph. I don't have a lot of my own good cases. Um, I know Steve's done one or two. This is certainly an area of emerging research that I think that I'll probably be doing this more in the next five to 10 years. Um, part of the reason why I don't do it is because I don't know how to do it yet because there's a lot of options. There's an industry option where you can kind of smash the biceps, gives you a nice graph, so a nice autograph that you can use similar to what we use the dermal allograph for. It's a very intriguing option because it's low cost. You don't have to pay for a dermal allograph. I just haven't seen a lot of clinical outcome studies. Where I think the biceps probably is going to be more beneficial is going to be for an anterior cable reconstruction for your large kind of massive tears. Um, but again, we don't have a good technique for that. Some people are leaving the biceps intact and rerouting it. Some people are detaching 
attaching the biceps and then attaching it um, to the greater tuberosity. And so there are at least some studies out there looking at it. There's actually enough studies that there's a systematic review of those studies. The challenge with the systematic review is that it showed that it's an option, but they don't really know what it's an option for. And so I think it's something where we're going to need a little more research and a little more clinical outcome studies. But I'm intrigued enough to do this in the next year or two. And I know Steve's done it for a couple of patients. Uh, so I certainly think there is a patient. I think it's probably going to be more for an anterior cable reconstruction for a large tear. Moving on next to balloon spacers. I was one of the people who kind of, you know, Steve and I both fought to get this here at UVA. I mean, full disclosure, I haven't done one yet. And that's necessarily, not necessarily because I don't want to do one. It's because I'm trying to figure out who the right patient is. So it needs to be a patient without arthritis, a fairly young patient, although the indication is probably an older patient if you look at the FDA indication for it. At least in my, my opinion, they need to have relatively good function. You're probably not going to uh, reverse pseudo, pseudo uh, so my goodness. Um, you're not going to reverse pseudoparalysis with a uh, balloon spacer. One of the other challenges is, is there's these two randomized controlled trials, so getting insurance to pay for it. And we actually had a really nice journal club where we looked at these two randomized controlled trials. And if you dig into them, they have different indications for it, and kind of the, the methods of the studies are very different. But the first one in JBJS shows that it works. And again, some of those are the, the royalty-bearing surgeons who, uh, who published that paper. Um, the, the randomized controlled trial in the UK, they actually stopped it. So they said that debridement was better. And that doesn't necessarily mean that balloon does have an, indica a, a, an indication in 2023, just means they need to be selective on who you do the indications for. So for balloon spacers, the results for randomized controlled trials are still conflicted. And so I think it's challenging to get insurance to pay for it and so you need to pick the right, the right patients for it. I think they really do have a role. And I like when Winston came back from his traveling fellowship, he talked about how you, a lot of the, the, the sites in Asia are using it to augment a massive cuff repair. I think there is a really good role for it there. And um, we're doing a massive cuff repair just to kind of offload that repair a little bit. So I think that's where it will fall into my practice. But there's certainly a heavy industry and advertising influence for it, people trying to get patients by doing balloon spacers. And so I'm a little bit of a late adopter for this, but I'm sure I'll be doing more likely to augment. This is Steve case. So I just wanted to show you that we are doing these here. You'll notice this is the perfect patient for it. Non-arthritic, great function beforehand, just having pain. Um, and so I kind of won't belabor you with the MRIs. We're probably running a little short on time, but had um, large supraspinatus tear, um, but minimal atrophy. And if you look when he got in there, um, minimal arthritis, but still large supraspinatus tear. So able to repair some of that posterior cuff up and then deploy the balloon spacer. This patient is still earlier in the recovery, but was doing very well initially. Um, so a lot of this talk, I just want to focus on superior capsule reconstruction. So it's very interesting, at least to me, because this has changed a lot, even in my practice. And so when I first started to practice, this was a really kind of exciting thing. Uh, you know, I did them a lot in fellowship and really was going to be the guy who did those when I came to UVA. So I probably did about 20 or 25 of them my first year in practice. And now I do maybe two a year. And so something obviously changed over time that changed pretty rapidly. And I think it's, and you'll notice this is the one that I have the most on and off buttons for, because you really have to have narrow indications for this. So they need to not have arthritis. They need to be younger patients. In general, I like them to have reasonable function. Although there's some papers showing reversal of pseudoparalysis, I'm not convinced that it does that on a routine basis. And they need to have reasonable cuff muscle. And so if you think back to JT's algorithm, the cuff muscle still needs to be alive to get this procedure to work. Why do it? The reason to do it is because you can get good outcomes, but you need to understand that a lot of those outcomes are in with use of fasciolata autograft. And so they, it's a different procedure when you use dermal allograft. Um, the early US outcomes have been published in kind of two and five year outcomes using dermal allograft. In general, those patients have done well. Um, certainly in my practice, I've seen a fair number of failures of these, usually off the glenoid side. Um, and it definitely makes for a miserable reverse replacement when you're going back in. So um, I certainly like superior capsule reconstruction. It just needs to be an appropriately indicated patient. This was a study I did recently with one of my co-residents who's now in practice at, in Virginia Beach. Um, but we looked and kind of pulled across Anna and saw, you know, for surgeons who are two to five you know, years in practice at least, compared to five years ago, how are you using SCR? And you can see about 50% of surgeons said their use has decreased. And so it's definitely a national trend. I think we just kind of overshot it a little bit and needed to have better indications um, for, for that surgery. I'll just show you one or two patients. This was one of the first SCRs I did in practice. He's a 44-year-old guy. In full disclosure, I would not do an SCR in this patient again. Um, but he's very young, left shoulder pain and weakness. He's got some arthritis. He's got some superior migration. So a few things working against him. Reasonable function, but pretty weak. Problem was manual labor and young. Uh, so full thickness subscap tear, in general, that's going to be a contraindication to a, to a superior capsule reconstruction, but I thought I could repair it. 
And then he had superior migration with a full thickness retracted supraspinatus tear. The thing that intrigued me was that he didn't have a lot of atrophy, at least with supraspinatus. He had subscap and infraspinatus atrophy, and so I thought it'd be well worthwhile giving him a chance. His arthritis was present, but not awful, and did a large dermal allograft for him. That's a video of his case. And of course, like I said, I'm only going to show you patients who do well. Um, and so this is him actually at four years post-op. And so he ended up getting bilateral SCRs. And so there's definitely a role for it. I would definitely not get an MRI of this patient. I'm not convinced that either of his SCRs are still intact. I don't want to get an x-ray because he's probably superior migrated. Um, but whatever I did, it seemed to work well. And so there's certainly patients that you can do an SCR on that do well. You just got to be really picky about who you do them for. And since I was bashing SCR a little bit, this is another guy. He's a local tennis pro. Um, although he's not moving the left arm well, the left arm is not the arm that had surgery. The right arm is the side that had surgery. Um, he got seen by one of the local places, uh, kind of community practices in town, and told he needed a reverse replacement. And he was really worried about it for playing tennis. Again, this is another patient who, based on x-ray criteria, SCR probably wasn't the best option. He's acetabularization of his acromion, no rotator cuff to speak of. Muscle actually doesn't look great, but he talked me into it. He actually has donated to the department since then. Um, it's done really well with an SCR. So you can certainly get some good outcomes. I just didn't show you all the failures that I had that ended up getting reverse replacements. Um, and so finally, what about reverse replacement? I do a lot of reverse replacements. I do a lot of them for massive cuffs. Again, it's just picking the right patients. Certainly, if they have arth arthritis, they're going to get a reverse replacement. If they're older, they're going to get a reverse replacement. If their cuff muscle is alive, I'm trying to think of a way not to do a reverse replacement for them. This was a recent article that came out that looked at the, the kind of indicators for reverse arthroplasty um, in, in the registry. And if you, the, the font's really, really small down there, so it's hard to see. But interestingly, the majority of, of reverse replacements now are not done for cuff tear arthropathy. They're done for glenohumeral arthritis. And then what's steadily increasing over time is for rotator cuff tears without arthritis. And so there's definitely increasing indications for using reverse for this indication. And uh, so a couple of key points about it. You can get great improvement in function and pain, but the patients need to understand the limitations. We're getting better with internal rotation, but it's not perfect. And so if it's a lady who comes in the office who says she can't buckle up her bra, probably not the right person for reverse replacement. The people that I worry about, and we've published papers on both of these, are patients who have preserved preoperative function. If they have 180 degrees of forward elevation, they may not love the reverse. And our most recent study showed they'll probably lose about 20 degrees of forward elevation if they, if they have above 120 to start. The other ones I worry about are the opposite end of the spectrum. The patient who has terrible function but has zero pain. That patient will like their reverse. They'll get better forward elevation, but they're not going to be your happiest patient because they probably will have some discomfort and they'll recognize that they have a mechanical shoulder. Another thing is a lot of patients are worried about complications of reverses. We've gotten a lot better with that, whether it's because the surgeons have gotten better because we've gotten better at teaching the next generation of surgeons how to do it, or because the improvements in design. Complication rates are now the same, or at least in some registry studies, probably below that of anatomic arthroplasty. And then age is an important consideration. I certainly do them in youngest patients. My youngest patient has a reverse is 21 years old, um, and she had rheumatoid arthritis. But younger patients in general are going to have a slightly higher rate of dissatisfaction and a higher rate of complications. So if you're going to do it on a young patient for a rotator cuff problem, make sure that you're doing it for a good indication. Um, so I'll show one reverse arthroplasty case. This was a younger guy, 60, right-hand dominant. He's a nationally ranked archer. Um, he had left shoulder pain. And he's kind of at this key point where he was going to lose his national ranking unless something got done. Couldn't move his arm at all. 60 degrees of forward elevation, did not get better with an injection. Um, and so he had a awful sagittal MRI, which I see a lot when they get referred to us, they kind of cut it out. And so I at least anticipated some atrophy. He had a full thickness subscap tear that was pretty retracted. And so I, I talked to him about superior capsule reconstruction. I was worried about the outcome of it. Also talking about reverse and he was really attracted about getting back quicker. Um, and so he ended up with a reverse arthroplasty and has done very, very well. Um, he's got reasonable internal rotation. L4, L5 is considered functional. At least in our most recent study, about 50% of patients will achieve functional internal rotation with a reverse. And so he's very happy with it, but obviously you'll have patients who don't get good internal rotation. We'll certainly notice that. But the outcomes with reverse are getting better and better. And so it tempts us to do more and more of them for this, but there's still a role for the other procedures. So I'll just end with this. Thanks to Dr. Miller for inviting me to, to do this. This just came out in January 2023, but basically covered all of these in a recent clinic in sports medicine. So if you're bored and want to read a lot of papers that some of our residents here wrote, uh, feel free to take a look at this. Thanks. So we're trying to stay on schedule. We got a couple minutes. Anybody has any questions for Any questions, Mark? Well, we're going to move right along. We'll keep this session to catch it, and then we'll have a little bit of breaks for the.